So um, I'm gonna introduce myself. I'm Kai Wilson. I'm a former artistic director of the Boston Jewish Film Festival. And I am so happy and honored to be moderating this Q&A with uh, Veronica Selver and Susan Fanchel, 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 uh, the co-directors of the wonderful film, Ermi. And hello, hello, Veronica. Hello, Susan. Hello, Hi. Hi. Um, Hi. And hello to everybody who has Zoomed in tonight. And welcome, this uh, is the first live event of the 33rd Boston Jewish Film Festival. And you can use the chat function to submit your questions to Veronica and Susan, and we'll get as many as we can um, in tonight to discuss, but let me kick off the conversation with a, with a few questions of my own. Um, first, um, I wanna congratulate you, Veronica and Susan, on your film. It's, it's really an amazing film. Ermi was, was an amazing person, and so is her story but also remarkable is your, your filmmaking, uh, the documentary structure, the editing, the narration, the use of archival footage. I could go on and on, but everything works so beautifully together. And in this Sunday's Boston Globe, film critic Peter Keogh called Ermi astonishing, heartbreaking and life affirming. And anybody who has seen the film would agree with, would agree with him. So just so, I, just so our listeners know, you are both very accomplished filmmakers. You're both editors. You've worked on award-winning films and you put it all together. And I guess it's really no surprise that you've created such an exceptional film. So, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So my first qu question is about your collaboration on Ermi. How did that come about? And what were your roles and and how did they evolve while you were making the film? Well, I'll start maybe, huh? Okay, okay. Should I start? Just because um, <clears throat> it, I, I began the film on my own I, without Susan, mm -hmm. but with, with an understanding in my own mind that Susan would be a part of it. We're, we're very old, very dear friends. And, um, and, I started the film, that is to say, I, I began, I began uh, putting, putting things together, putting some sequences together. So the, the, the film really began <clears throat> when a um, dear friend said, why don't you use Ermi's memoir as a narrative for your film? Before that, I just had scattered sequences and I didn't really know what to do with them. I did know that I had a kind of desire to, to share Ermi, if I can put it that way. I just, I just wanted uh, her to be known to others because she meant just that much to me. It's a very personal motivation initially. And, and um, after I had sort of started putting things together, putting, I, I enlisted Susan. I, I just, I, I knew that it was the right collaboration and, um, and Susan acquiesced. <laughs> and so you go back a long ways together. We do. Yeah. 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 And, and um, what were your roles on the film? Um, we, we really, we really collaborated as 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 directors in so far mm -hmm. as we generated ideas together. Mm -hmm. We we thought of solutions together. I would say that that in the process of doing it, uh, Susan really became the primary editor. I mean, I mean, we were always together. Mm -hmm. Although Susan lives in New York, I live in Oakland. Nonetheless, the collaboration was very close. And often we were in each other's place. That is to say, I was in New York, Susan was okay. here. So we worked together a lot physically. Uh, Susan was the, the primary editor. Okay. Um, and, but really it was just a, a sort of such, a, such an organic collaboration that I can't really define anymore 
in a sense, who did what or who thought what through. We just um, know each other well enough to have enormous uh, confidence and trust in each other. And uh, I think, you know, this was really a case of two heads are better than one. <laughs> And I think the, the film just co comes across su as such a, a labor of love and um, a, a celebration and a tribute to, um, to your mother. It's, it's, it, just, it just permeates the, the entire film. It's really, really special. So, um, and I'm, I'm wondering um, how long, um, Oh, excuse me a second. Uh, could you talk about the narration of the film? Um, it's it's very effective. Um, you have um, you begin the film. Um, it's with your with your voiceover and um, the then you sort of welcome us welcome us to the film and and bring us into into um, Ermi's world. But then. Um, Hannah Shigula um, is reads from um, Ermi's narration. Excuse me, Ermi's Ermi's memoir. And then at times there'll be you'll hear your sister Irene and her um, voiceover. So could you talk about all that went into to um, kind of building building that that narration? Well, you know, I'll I'll say that. Yeah, the, there's there are multiple voices in the film telling mm -hmm. telling the story. Mm -hmm. um, for in, in a certain way, Ermi's voice is the um, especially in the first half of the film, mm -hmm. she's really the the narration engine of the film. While there are multiple voices, you know, hers is really the the structural do dominating structural voice. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, you know, part of the creative problem of the film was to integrate the different voices of the film um, and to um, allow audiences to get to know the different perspectives on that story and on that person um, in such a way that they could also have a building relationship Mm -hmm. you know, that was organic, that was mm -hmm. clear. Um, so that, that was some, that was big, that was probably the, the big challenge of the film was to find the overriding structure that integrated multiple voices. And it's so fluid. It just, it just moves in and out of the, the different voices. So um, um, to say organically and so, so gracefully. And I, 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 I thought it was interesting that, um, Sometimes I wasn't sure if it was you talking, Veronica, or if it was um, um, Irene, and I just I just attributed that to being sisters because sometimes you know sisters sound sisters sound alike. So. Well, you know, it's very funny because I was just going to add that before you brought it on, before you brought it up, I was going to say that Irene and I sound very much alike. Do. In fact, you know, occasionally when we would uh, when when we would uh, call Ermi. Uh, she wouldn't know which one it was. Okay. <laughs> and and so um, what was interesting to me, as you said, you know, sometimes it's Irene's voiceover, sometimes it's mine. In actuality, if you really look at the film, uh, it's it, it, the voiceover is, is usually mine. And Irene is almost always attached to her image mm -hmm. either, either after or before. In other words, she goes into voiceover or comes from voiceover in. But... But, um, you know, in the end, and I thought about this, I thought, is it important that one knows that this is Irene talking or it's me talking? And, and it, didn't, it didn't matter in the end. I know that was my, my feeling. There were things, moments when I thought, well, maybe they'll think it's me. So? Yeah, and, and that's, that's how I was reacting, having a, a, a sister who's very close in age and we sound alike. And even when I was younger, sometimes we would, we would pretend to be each other. So I think that kind of um, merge, that, that sort of melding or merging was, was um, um, effective, effective. Um, 
I'm looking at some of the um, questions. Questions. See what, what kind of chats are coming. Chats are coming our way. Okay. Um, how did you get the great, the great Hannah Shagula? How did she? How did she become involved in this film? Because it's really, um, she just um, is so beautiful. Her voice in this film. Yeah. Well. <clears throat> Um, that's a very, uh, uh, this is the long, the long, the long take on this yeah. at, um, for a long time, I was, I was my mother's voice in the film mm -hmm. when I was cutting, I was my mother's voice, which I appreciated. I thought I was doing a fine job and, and, um, it became clear that I could not be my mother's voice because I had to have a voice of my own. Mm -hmm. And so did my mother. And, but, but it took really some time to sort of understand and, shift that and a friend when I was cutting it a friend of mine who was a filmmaker said you know you really can't be your own your own voice you have to get an actress and I said it, somewhat defiantly I must admit okay in that case it's Harashiro <laughs> and then it took it took some it took some years before the film was ripe enough if I may put it that way to actually uh, contact her and, and uh, we contacted her <clears throat> through friends who got her email. And I wrote to her very simply, I wrote a letter and said, you know, said that um, this is the film we've made and are making and would she <clears throat> consider being my mother's voice? And about two weeks later, she wrote back and said she would open to the, open to the suggestion. And we met, she lives in Paris, I was in Paris, we met. I brought her Hermes memoir and she read it that very evening. And the next day she said, I'm, I'm on, I, I would like to do this very much. And it, she just, it was so, it just flowed from that moment forward. She, she was very, very, uh, very up for it. And, um, and very skilled, obviously. And also just to add one thing, um, it, was, it was very important to her to be the voice of a Jewish, German Jewish woman to be the voice of that experience because she comes from the other side of the story. Mm. And uh, it was um, it not at all a neutral uh, desire on her part. What, what would you add, Susan? Well, just that um, I think Hannah should have said yes to the project after reading Ermi's memoir, you know, um, and, and not based on our credentials. I mean, really it was Ermi's credentials that, that, that moved her. And she didn't actually see the finished film until after, after she had done the narration. Um, so it, it, there was some, some strong re reactions that she had to Ermi's story. And one, interesting um, postscript is that uh, recently when we were showing the film in, in Berlin at the Jewish Film Festival in Berlin, Hannah had sent to Veronica a short film that she made herself. And um, it was, a, a, I think a, a five minutes long. It's not, a, it's a short. And we showed it before Ermi at the festival. And it was, um, it was just so moving to me um, to see the film with Ermi because mm -hmm. this film is, what's it called, Veronica? Hana? It's called <coughs> Hana Hana. <coughs> Hana. And it's, it, it's um, visually, it is um, completely um, images of the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. And her narrative voice is very personal. It's about her own, mm. the, the fact that she was named Hannah after a Jewish woman who was very um, mysterious to her. I mean, mm. I, it's not a, um, a didactic story. It's a very poetic uh, story that she tells in a completely evocative way. And, she actually um, kind of sing, I um, wouldn't call it singing, but 
a kind of musing in voice that, that, mm -hmm. that is sung. And anyway, it's a very beautiful, moving um, statement that she made on her own. And, and I, I, I suddenly really understood why she um, so connected with Ermi's story and wanted to do this. I mean, it was really very genuine. That's really fascinating. That's a really fascinating story. And, um, but, but um, bravo to you, Veronica, for saying, I want Hannah Shabula. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have Hannah Shabula. <laughs> bravo. I was lucky. <laughs> okay, Thanks, well, you made me. your luck. You made your own luck. Um, <laughs> could, could you um, elaborate on um, Ermi's um, remarkable um, resilience? And I know that's, that's, she's so often described as, you know, I think is resilient and but and but how how did that express itself in like everyday life in in New York and and um, and when did you and your sister become aware of it and and did your understanding of it change over time and and if so how uh, understanding of Ermi's particular resilience do you mean yeah or yeah. Yes, I think it must have changed over time, only in so far as when you're a child and it's your mother and mm -hmm. and she's just there in her fullness, which she was. She was very engaged with our lives as children. She she um, she 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 gave parties. She gave Mardi Gras parties for us every year. She drove us to school, brought us back from school. She was very 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 involved and wonderful mother, and. And um, we just we just took it in, cherished that, and, and we loved her. We we were very just to mention one thing which you didn't bring up, but which people sometimes ask, which is how soon did you know that your mother lost two children mm -hmm. um, before you were born? And and um, while I, neither Irene nor I can answer that question, we do not know. We just know that we always knew it. We just cannot remember not knowing it, but it was part of what we, what we brought to our feelings for our mom, mm -hmm. all the same. We had a, fine, a kind of protective feeling, I think we did. Mm -hmm. um, and where I really sort of felt her, what, you know, what I call a kind of moral stamina, she just had the kind of st stamina of, of being. Uh, was particularly after our dad died, and which, which you know we were 13, 14, and we came back to America. We'd been in France, and Ermi really began to be a working mother. She was a working single mother, and she just did it with so much, so much grace, really, and and enthusiasm, and again stamina. She, she, and, and I, yeah, I just you know I I just felt. I just felt such a, I recognized it more and more as I, as I, as I got older and as she got older. I just felt this, this kind of what the French would call courage, you know, it's not, it's not physical courage in terms of, but in terms of sort of a kind of, a kind of, again, a kind of moral stamina. I don't know what else to call it, but I just, resilience if you want. And yeah. I just, uh, Felt that very much. I don't know. Susan knew knew Ermi for many many years as well. And and Susan, did you have any any thoughts on on that as well? Near, from what you're, you're... you know, I, I I learned so much um, later. I mean, for a good time that I knew Ermi as mm -hmm. Veronica and Irene's mother, I did not know the full story of what had happened, that, that there were other children that she lost. It was not that it was kept secret. It's just that Hermi never talked about it. Um, and um, I can't remember myself when I found out. So I knew her without, um, I would say, even the burden of thinking about, because I was quite young. I was 13 or 14 when, mm -hmm. well, or Maybe 14, 15, when we when we when we all met each other and started to become close friends. Mm -hmm. And Ermi was a parent. And 
a wonderful, warm, lively, um, welcoming parent who um, I went on to know for many years, both with and without Veronica, because I, I was often with her in the summer when the, the two daughters were not there. Anyway, I, 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 I I think that anything I would say now would be reflective of this whole process of making the film and, and putting together all kinds of, I certainly, when I read Ermi's memoir, there were many things I did not know, even though I had known her for 30 years. So, um, so that I, I have to interject, you know, this sense of resilience as a quality in relationship to what she went through, mm -hmm. whereas mm -hmm. perhaps most of the time, that I met her, I didn't think of her as resilient. I, you know, she had a very vivacious, very lively, very engaging personality. And um, she made me feel very much at home with her and welcome in her home. Um, but I think it's really now and after making the film that all of these deeper insights come about. Emerge, all right. That's, that's, um, that's interesting. Um, I was thinking one of the, the um, photos that I, I loved in the film, well, there were many, but um, was Ermi driving all the children to school um, in, the, in, the, in the convertible the t with the top down. And um, I counted them because I thought, how many kids can fit into a car? And there, were, there was almost a dozen. There were only just, just short, there were 10. Um, and they were they were just uh, some of the images and the, and her face, the um, um, pictures of her her of her smiling, and there were just so many times where you you just felt the uh, um, the strength and the warmth of of uh, of her personality. Um, the art. No, excuse me. No, I just want may I say just one thing? You know, my mother yeah. was actually in truth. Very modest. Pardon? <laughs> My mother was very modest. I mean, she was a very lively, but but I mean, the idea that there's, that there's a film about her, the idea that her story would would be projected and would be in, in this way would absolutely floor her. <laughs> would it? And so that's such a did did she see herself as a um, as a dynamic person? Um, I mean, did, did she, she was actually know she, that? Oh, no, she didn't. No, huh? No, I mean, she she was a full person, but she 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 was actually, frankly, she was uh, you know very very uh, very much uh, inclusive and and outgoing in a certain way, and really quite shy and uncertain in, in many other ways. So the, the, the fact that she wrote her memoir was a huge accomplishment for her. It meant so much that she was able to do that and to give it to her grandchildren. Um, but she did not have a, um, a, very, a very large sense of her own um, contribution, if you want. Her own presence and, and impact, yeah. Impact, impact. anyway. Sorry, I interrupted you, I think. No, no, you're here to talk. I'm um, to I'm to to listen so to, to listen to you. Um, the the archival material in this film is is really uh, really amazing and the newsreel footage of the 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 ship the Simon Bolivar and uh, the associated newspaper clipping of the the sinking of the ship and the book of photos of Ermie and Carl's um, furniture you know the their artwork um, the home movies in the Netherlands. Um, could, you, could you talk more about some of the archive material, uh, what you acquired and what um, you had available to you? Because it seems like you had a lot um, available as well as um, um, material that you, you acquired. Well, I'll just talk about what we had available in terms of the, 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 the home movies. We were very, very fortunate in that when, um, for my, for my father's 50th birthday in France in 1951, my mother made a surprise film for him. She, she hired a camera person in Versailles and put this black and white footage together. She had little ideas of scenes 
And so some of what you see that's really of us, that moving footage, you know, actually film footage uh, of, our, of, of us in the schoolroom, of, of our dad at work, uh, it was all came out of my mother's uh, film that she made, which lay dormant for many, many years, 20, 30 years in which we sort of resurrected uh, and uh, saw that it survived and we digitized it. So that was a very, very wonderful and, and, and unanticipated contribution to the film. In terms of, in terms of, and, and we had a lot of photos. The, a lot of photos came from when Ermi lost everything, if we can put it that way. Um, people had, you know, relatives and friends and had, had mementos, they had photos. And um, the book, the book that, that shows Ermi's apartment, Ermi and Carl's apartment in Chemnitz was a gift that came back to Ermi. So we were able to, and Ermi was able to gather in her own lifetime, some of these things that had been given to her. And we were able to, of course, have those. And then in terms of, of um, Suze, why don't you talk about the archival material that we gathered that was not family material? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that was something that we continued to do throughout the whole making of the film was to supplement the, the well, the fact that there was footage of the Simon Bolivar was just kind of fantastic, that it was so specific, that it happened to be historic, that it was the first ship that was mined um, and, and went down with, with passengers. So it, it made headline news and, um, and it was discoverable. You know, the archival research process these days with the internet and with all of the different um, archival materials that are available. It, it's, it's a process to find the ones that best suit your story. And, mm -hmm. and you know, you can look under nooks and nooks and crannies and sun, you know, suddenly discover things where you least expected them, you know, that, that make the story come alive, you know. And um, an example of that would be Ermi's subway ride, you know, where she's talking about um, the seeing somebody on a New York City subway reading in Jewish, you know, we're reading the Jewish forward and actually seeing Jewish writing in, you know, not hidden, you know, you know, somebody just reading. And that, well, we we found these wonderful um, photos of people of that time on the subway and reading newspapers and we were able to use the forward um, to uh, actually the right date. <laughs> you just get a little yeah. bonkers, yeah. you know, looking for the specificity of something. But, you know, if you look in the right place, you find it. And we also had wonderful help. We have to give credit to our, to um, Rachel Antel, who, who did this wonderful um, archival research for us and was constantly, oh, I found this. Take a look at this. See if this will work for you. We we had a lot of trouble finding the right trains, you know, that were in Europe at that time huh? appropriate for the story. Um, anyway, it 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 was part of the labor of love to look for the right images and find them. Yeah, it's an amazing amazing mix. Uh, we have a we have a question here. Um, and a comment. Um, thank you both for making such a lovely film. The structure of the film so mirrors Ermi's many facets. Um, how has the family responded to the film since it has been on the festival circuit? Well, the, um, the, the, the great good news is that Irene really loves the film and, and um, Irene, of course, is my sister. Irene is Irene. And, and that, that's been the, really our, our greatest satisfaction because, because uh, while we were making it, um, she stayed sort of appropriately distant from it, I would say. She obviously contributed a wonderful interview. I think a just terrific interview. But, but on the whole, she did feel that this was, this was a film that was from 
to a large extent, she felt my perspective and she was on the sidelines. But um, when, we got, when we did it and we finished it, she just was our first and foremost fan. So that was extremely satisfying. Our, her, her children, my, my nieces, Anna and Eve, I think we did some, you know, I did some thorough interviews with them. It wound up that less of those interviews were in the film than, than, than we covered in the end. Uh, so I think, I think they might've been a little surprised that there wasn't more of, but I, I can't even say that because I think they're very, they're very proud and very pleased and very honored. And I think it, you know, we had, we had friends of my niece, friends in, at, at, in Berlin, uh, almost at, you know, uh, there are probably some friends right out there. <laughs> and, uh, Reveal yourself friends out, <laughs> out there. <laughs> no, I think it's been very, very well received. And of course, Susan's family, it's just been, Fantastic. Susan's niece came to Berlin to, 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 to be with us during that time of the festival. <laughs> yeah. so. the, um, another question from Mark. Uh, we loved the story about driving to Paris with a former neighbor from the Netherlands. Um, did Ermi go back to visit that town? Um, um, is it I'm not sure, is, is it the, a former neighbor from the Netherlands or are we talking about the, the Dutch couple? Well, the Dutch couple are former neighbors from the Netherlands. In other words, okay. the, the, the okay. Dutch right. it's the right. same story. That's right. Uh, and, and, you know, the funny thing is, I have to say that both, both um, uh, Irene and I have different memories. Irene remembers distinctly, we, we went to Holland, we lived in, we lived in France and, and during our, our school vacations, we would go different places. We went to Holland quite often. My mother loved Holland. She loved the Dutch, she loved Holland. And we went, we went you know, I don't know, five, six, seven trips to, to Holland. And on one of those, we did go to Ardenhout, but Irene remembers it and I don't. So I really can't speak about that, but Ermi did, we did go back. Um, as Irene tells me, uh, what was extraordinary is this encounter with the, with the Dutch, with the Dutch young woman who was once a child with Ermi's son, and that was an extraordinary situation, extraordinary event. And actually, when we got to Paris, um, and the Dutch couple went on to Holland, that next weekend the mother of that came to see us in Versailles and spent the weekend with us and. It was, you know, kind of an extraordinary re reunification of something totally un unimaginable for both sides. But um, yes, yes, Ermi was was able to um, to go back. And there was there was the um, when she goes into when this was Hemnitz, I believe, when you went to Hemnitz, Hemnitz. Mm -hmm. and, then, and she goes into. Um, a, a pharmacy, and there's the uh, the man who put the spider down her blouse when she was ten years old, um, and she has these um, these content these con uh, encounters, these these um, really wonderful yeah. encounters with people. Um, yeah. Did um, another question? Did Ermi stay in touch with her two stepsons from her second marriage? Yes, she did. Yes, she did, and that is again something that we just didn't find a way to include, but she did very much. And, and uh, one, of them, one of them lived in upstate New York and the other lived in New York City and he became really a part of our family. Alfred was just somebody that we saw a lot. And um, his, his, he got married, he had two daughters and the daughters uh, in some respects considered Ermi a grandmother. Mm. <laughs> So it, it's, uh, Ermi was extremely, not only good at, but it meant so much to her to keep, keep her connections alive. And she did it, she did it with, with, with great gusto and, and success. Yeah. All of her, for example, all of Carl's sisters 
well, all, I mean, two sisters. They were our aunts. We called them, you know, Tante Susa, Tante Friedel. They were, they were the, the, the sisters of Carl. And they were like aunts to us, so. Well, she, she came from just uh, the, in the, the beginning of the, the documentary and you learn about her family and she came from a large family and it was very close and supportive family. And it, it sounds as though that went, that extended to the to succeeding generations, that kind of um, family, bringing, bringing family yeah. together. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, what did you uh, want to include in the film, but ultimately you had to leave out? And, and did you sometimes disagree? Did you and Susan sometimes disagree about, you know, you wanted, you wanted it to stay or go and she had the other, another take on it? I'll let Susan answer that. <laughs> um, well, I, you know, there were a number of interviews that were very poignant with, with, with who were included in a longer version of the film. I guess it was longer <laughs> um, for a long time that we both really thought were terrific, but through a process of showing the film and really kind of being able to step back and see that there were too many characters and that it was losing less, we needed to, to, to eliminate things that just were not really central to the story. And that was hard, but I don't, yeah. um, and you know, one could talk about each one of those characters that we had to leave out. And it was, um, and if I were to tell you about it, you would say, well, that sounds really interesting. That sounds like a really, you know, wonderful character. And yeah, we, we, you know, we thought so, but, but the decision to, to eliminate those, I, I, I don't think we ever had a disagreement about that. I mean, I think we both, sometimes one person saw sooner than the other that mm -hmm. that could go, because that was really an important part of the way that the film really became the film that it is, mm -hmm. was letting go of things, not just finding the right stories, but le yeah. letting go of the excess. And, yeah. and, um, and making those kinds of choices was hard. Um, but we did, you know, I, don't, I, can't, I can't think of something that, where we bumped heads about that. Okay, neither can I. Oh. Paula asks, did um, um, Ermi's brothers survive the war? Yes, Ermi's brothers survived the war. Um, and the most astonishing brother, uh, insofar as he survived the war, he was in a concentration camp. And he was in Westerbrook, which I think was a Dutch concentration camp. Or concentration. Yes. Yeah. Um, and he, he was there for, for four years and he survived. And um, as, as, with, as with others, um, he could not talk about it. Okay. We, have, we have time uh, for about two more questions. So, um, um, I'd like to know about um, the animation that you opened the film with, because I think it was um, surprising and so effective um, between your your voice and um, um, you know here and then and then you're talking about Ermi's voice come in and and then the door opens and you see this sunny, lovely place that that uh, I felt you were seeing at the end another beautiful sunny place with flowers and you know her her party. Um, all the sunflowers and, and uh, so how did how did you decide on um, opening it that way and with the, with the animation? Well, I, I I I'd like Susan to answer that because the animation was her idea. Okay. <laughs> but the animation was my idea, but that was a good example of a collaboration because um, we we struggled with different openings for the film 
over a period of time and we had different openings. And um, the, the opening that made it to the top was, was one that was based very much on um, a kind of this idea of, of welcoming you into Ermi's home that happened with a, um, a narration that, uh, well, so a, a good friend told, she's an artist and she told this, she just described what it was like to walk into Ermi's apartment. And it was just so uh, colorful and, and warm and vivid that we tried to use that as a way to, to kind of start the film. And we had still photographs, very uninteresting ones, but that gave you visualization of, of what Ermi's apartment looked like. Because of course, we were making the film a number of years after she had passed away. And so we, we couldn't go back to the apartment and film it. Um, so that idea lingered and I had the idea of animating it. And then Veronica liked that idea and we pursued it together looking at who might be that animator. And that was a process. And, um, and actually it was a, a woman who was French and Veronica was able to contact her and that relationship developed. So it was a little bit of a saga, but one in which, you know, that was a good example of, you know, we agreed it was a good idea. I had this idea. She said, well, I like that idea. And then we kind of put our heads together and, and made it happen. Yeah. And, and we had this wonderful, talented woman who came, came in and, 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 did, and just did it. And it, it was really fun. And it's a lovely, it's a lovely opening, and uh, it it um, it makes you feel good just watch just just watching you know watching it and and, um, and that was what it was like to go into her apartment. Yeah, yeah. You really felt good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, one more question, and um, and I, I think our, our time is up, unfortunately. Um, it seemed that that Ermi had so many friends and. Um, in so many different in, in different countries, um, I'm thinking I'm thinking um, going back to England with the friends who really uh, supported her um, after um, she lost her husband and and children, and and once one couple that said you know your grief is our grief and and uh, it seems that that friendship friends and friendship um, were such a big part of of Ermi's life and and. I wonder if, if uh, Veronica, you could talk about, um, you could talk about that, um, uh, your uh, mother and, and friendship. Yeah. Well, as I, as I think I, I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, my mother was extremely, not, not skilled is not it. It was, it was, um, it was key to her own resilience, to use that word. It was key that she, um, she really, um, well, I, I'm thinking of the kindness of strangers. It's a sort of a sentence that's come into my head, but my mother counted deeply on friendship. Um, um, it was part of her survival, frankly. And those friends in particular became her closest friends. They were like surrogate parents to my sister and me. Tod and Max Victor. It's one of the few things that we were not able to fit into the film that that has lingered as something that I'm really sorry, because they were just, they were so profoundly part of Ermi's support. Uh, in later years, Trude and my mother spoke on the phone every single day until my mother died. And then Trude lived on, you know, maybe two more years, every single day for just checking in with each other. Um, and and it just was just crucial, crucial to her. And she was able to navigate that really large pool of friends <laughs> and maintain individual relationships with, you know, one of the, one of the things that, we, that was so fun on her birthday, which was you know, August 24th, Ermi would be on the phone until the party. And she would be on the phone in Dutch. She would be on the phone in German. She would be on the phone in English. She would be on the phone in French. <laughs> <laughs> she, 
friends were amazing. So, well, thank you both so much. This is really, uh, this was really wonderful. And uh, thank you, Kai. Yeah, it was wonderful talking with you. Oh, thank you. Thanks.